our moonshot for Marshall Clinic Health System is to zig when everyone else is zagging and really create a model of care that will work in rural environments. And I think we've we've hit upon it and um, we've really had to approach this in, in a variety of ways. We've had to expand our acute care. We were a clinic for 100 years and we realized that in order to deliver our mission and our promise of enriching lives, we had to innovate to develop new care models. We had to extend our efforts way beyond our own malls into our communities. And we really have to leverage the um, research capabilities that we have and the data to really better understand those, you know, those we serve and how we can really uh, meet their needs. Welcome to a and Healthcare Industry Group's What's Your Moonshot podcast series, where world-class healthcare leaders seek to solve big problems. Listen as we talk to today's health system CEOs about the journey to achieve their moonshots. Welcome to AM's What's Your Moonshot podcast, a podcast where we explore how innovative leaders are solving the greatest challenges in healthcare. My name is John McLean. I'm a managing director here at Alvarez and Marsal, and I'm here with my co host, as always, the Honorable Secretary Dr. David Shulkin. David, I know that you're very excited about our guest today. Um, like you, she is not only a physician, but one of the most impactful leaders in healthcare. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Turney, the CEO of the Marshall Clinic Health System. Um, Susan, welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome to you. Susan, it's really great to have you with us today. Uh, the What's Your Moonshot podcast is all about leaders who have big goals and who are courageous in healthcare. And it's a way to really just talk about what your vision about healthcare is and to share that with other people around the country who are trying to improve our healthcare system. And I know that you've been focused on addressing the problems in rural healthcare, something that's so important. Can you tell us a little bit about what your goals are for healthcare and maybe what's your moonshot? <laughs> you know, it's a um it's a great question and a momentous day seeing a manned spacecraft uh, take off and land in 11 minutes uh, with four newly minted astronauts. So uh, not quite to the moon, but a very impressive flight. You know, I think from my perspective, obviously Marshall Clinic Health System is a truly rural health system. We have served a rural population since we began over 100 years ago. and. You know, in the last uh, couple of decade, decades, um, we have really seen the systemic issues uh, come into a better view uh, and the challenges, obviously, that not just the um, rural providers face, but the challenges that our patients face as well. And then all of a sudden, you know, the uh, pandemic hit and it really exacerbated many of the problems that we face every day. One thing, and I know you understand this, David, is that rural uh, communities have patients who are older, sicker, and poorer than people who live in in around big cities in the more urban populations. And I think it's important to just put a little data around that because um, it's a way to really share the stark differences and the challenges that we do face. Our um, the medium income for a family of four in the communities that we serve primarily is about $8,000 less than the state average. And when we think about uh, people living in poverty, seven of the nine poorest counties in the state of Wisconsin are in our service area. And we know that um, you know the number of children who go to bed hungry that are living in poverty um, is a marker of what is happening uh, in our communities. And we have more children on free and reduced lunches than the state average. So if we, you know, if we look at the, um, uh, the, so that's kind of the state framework, but if you look at the national framework, we're actually seeing a very similar picture uh, in rural communities across the country. We know that about uh, one sixth or about 50 million Americans live in areas where there are healthcare shortages. That's um, become even much more of a crisis as we're seeing the number of hospitals, the number of physicians, uh, surgeons, paramedics continue to decline over the last 20 years. And we know that um, five out of every six rural Americans do live in a healthcare shortage area. And it's not just those numbers. When you think about um, what people experience from a health perspective, 
Um, Health Affairs actually did a, a really great article uh, just a bit ago that talked about children living in rural counties. They have a higher um, infant mortality rate. They have a higher child mortality rate and uh, death rates among young adults uh, compared to their urban force is greater as well. And in, in many areas of the state of Wisconsin, but across the country as well, half of rural women um, receive their perinatal uh, services more than 30 minutes from their home. And about 10% of those have to drive more than 100 miles to get care. And that's assuming they have transportation <laughs> because we know that there is um, a lack of public transportation many places in the country, but certainly in rural areas, um, we have very little public transportation. And we know that um, some of the difficulties our patients experience is the fact that they cannot access care because they don't have the resources to bring them to a community. And telehealth is a solution. I agree it's here to stay. We've been doing telehealth for over 30 years, yet we have many, many of our communities that do not have uh, broadband access. And um, if you don't have access to broadband, it's really quite difficult to have a virtual visit in your home or somewhere in your community. So when you think about putting all these factors together, the um, mix of the pandemic, rural health care, um, uh, which is a national crisis right now. Our moonshot for Marshall Clinic Health System is to zig when everyone else is zagging and really create a model of care that will work in rural environments. And I think we've we've hit upon it and um, we've really had to approach this in, in a variety of ways. We've had to expand our acute care. We were a clinic for 100 years and we realized that in order to deliver our mission and our promise of enriching lives, we had to innovate to develop new care models. We had to extend our efforts way beyond our own malls into our communities. And we really have to leverage the um, research capabilities that we have and the data to really better understand those, you know, those we serve and how we can really uh, meet their needs. And adding hospitals has been, you know, a big piece of this puzzle. We, when I joined the health system seven years ago, we had one hospital. Today we have 10 and we have more that are um, in development. And I know people wonder, why would you build hospitals? It's not where care is going. We need hospitals and our patients need hospitals, but we needed to right size the hospitals and continue to uh, look at ways to have patients get seen at the best site of care. But we do know that offering that full integrated approach by having the clinicians, by having the hospitals, by having a health plan, a provider-based health plan, we can really uh, achieve that full range of services close to home. And we can really uh, truly have an impact on cost, quality, and efficiency. And, um, you know, we have been able to demonstrate that through many of our programs. So again, um, the best way to keep most care local for our rural communities is, is um, bridging the gaps that exist, providing um, uh, easy access to care, providing transportation, um, allowing patients to receive their care at a more regional center when it's necessary, and continuing to stimulate the vitality of our communities by uh, keeping our hospitals open, keeping our clinics open, um, and uh, making sure that uh, the businesses that exist in those communities have an opportunity to be successful. So we're, we're um, continuing to collaborate. We're launching many initiatives that really deliver on our promise improving that patient experience, the outcome, lowering the cost of care. And we're hoping that um, we, um, we do believe actually that we're a national model for what can work in, in very rural America. <laughs> Just one other data point, but for people who live in larger communities, um, we serve about 1.2 million people over 45,000 square miles. And we have only one community where there's more than 50,000 people most of our sites are in communities of less than 2,000 people. So it just puts the whole thing in perspective. Wow. Well, you know, you, you mentioned the, the vitality of, you know, your local and community economies. And um, one question that we have is sort of, so stemming from the pandemic, there's even more staffing shortages, speaking of resources, um, from burnout and just from, um, for different reasons, we have greater needs for those resources and lesser of them. Um, covering all those miles and in 
and, and sort of ensuring the vitality of those communities, um, I'm sure it gets a lot harder when you probably have, I'm just guessing, lesser resources. You know, how is Marshfield uh, uh, sort of tackling that challenge to, um, you know, sort of keep, keep down the path of your moonshot? This is an issue that I'm sure every health system is facing right now. As uh, we think about the needs of, you know, providing the services that are services that are necessary for our patients and, ex you know, especially as we look to expand those services more into the community, but we are finding um, uh, that workforce really is 1 of our major challenges right now. And I would say that even though it has been pretty intense over the last several years, certainly the pandemic has uh, worsened uh, the situation that we're in. And I just again, like to put things in some perspective, because we all um, are starting from a different place. And when you think about pre pandemic, there were only about 40 of 180 US medical schools that offered a rural medicine track. Um, remembering that, you know, uh, a, a lot of people live in rural America and we know also that about 90% of final year medical residents uh, prefer to practice in communities with more than 50,000 people. And I already shared that we only have one community with more than 50,000 people. So if you think about the funnel and you uh, just put those numbers in perspective, um, it's clear that rural, um, rural health care is getting passed over. And then you think about um, how much worse things have gotten during the pandemic. And actually, even though we, um, had um, a surge at the end of last year, things did dip down. We're starting to see our numbers uh, go back up and talk to a colleague of mine in Missouri and they are obviously being hit very hard by the pandemic right now. And they are having to use a lot of traveling nurses and they're not able to staff because there aren't enough traveling nurses. And I think about the nursing shortage alone, which is going to continue into the future. Um, if our numbers uh, with inpatients continues to rise, we're stretched right now. I'm not sure where we will get the resource to take care of patients on the acute uh, care side on the short term. But it's also a physician shortage. And you know, the American Association of Medical Colleges did talk about uh, physician shortages, um, as many as 120,000 physicians by 2032. That's significant when we think about our uh, aging population and in general, people who are older tend to be sicker, have more chronic diseases. So you tackle that um, problem in the perspective of there are more jobs than people applying for jobs across the country. Um, and we know that the uh, number of talented workers in our communities is even less because there's no one across the street. When we um, have a shortage, we have to go, you know, cast a very wide net to bring, bring people into our communities to help us uh, take care of our patients. And, you know, we're working hard to do this, but we have to, and we have a lot of partners. We have uh, partners with our high schools, technical colleges, our universities to continue to create the pipeline. However, it's just, it's just not enough. And we, um, we will continue to do what we can for the people that we have because you pointed out that there is burnout and people have been stretched people are challenged to take breaks during the day when you know surger surgeries are scheduled back to back or the you know icu is at capacity so we're trying to do things to support the providers and staff we're um you know uh, uh, providing child care we're tutoring children we're providing wellness and mental health resources uh, we're doing other targeted support through our foundation, but um, it, it 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 just doesn't seem to be enough right now. So we um, we've invested a lot in our people. We've provided a very nice merit increase this year. We've enhanced our benefit package, but people have a limit as to what they can do. So we have to remember to keep this in perspective, and uh, it's challenging because most of our staff. They just don't say no. If there's a patient care need, they stay and take care of the patient. However, um, it is taxing them. There's no question about it. So we have to think about all of the systemic challenges that we face and address those systemic solutions. But the people problem uh, is a much more uh, uh, difficult challenge to um, get our arms around. 
and we'll continue to do everything we can to support our staff and to continue to uh, increase the pipeline. But um, we all know that that takes a tremendous amount of time and it isn't going to help us over the next year or two. So we we're facing some uh, pretty, pretty tough headwinds right now. Yeah, Susan, yeah. listening to you describe the situation that you face in your communities that you serve, it seems overwhelming. There are so many issues that you're dealing with. And I wonder whether you think about whether these are structural problems that you need to have addressed through legislation and the way that CMS interacts with rural healthcare systems, whether you think it's a matter of um, providing additional funding to help you achieve your goals. But when you, when you ask for help and you look towards government and public funding, what is it that you think is gonna make the most difference? You know, that's a, that's, that's a really um, deep question actually, because there are so many parts of what we're doing uh, or, or so many pieces of what we're doing that need to be addressed. As I said, there are the systemic issues. I'm not sure that the government can necessarily address the geographic uh, constraints that exist, knowing that we have, we don't have dense populations of people and uh, they're spread out through a wide geography. But if you think about the opportunity to, um, um, we know that about 50% of our missed appointments, for example, are because people don't have transportation. And we know that not only do they, can't they afford gas, so we can help them by providing gas cards. We know that if it's an elderly parent, the person bringing them often is someone who has to leave their job and doesn't have paid time off. And in many circumstances, they're bringing smaller children with them because they don't have anyone for childcare. So w when you think about the um, uh, how the how the government can help, um, I, I think the support around uh, critical access hospitals, rural health centers, uh, around other funding that CMS has provided has been very beneficial to our organization, but a lot of our challenges extend beyond the uh, facilities that we provide, uh, you know, direct hands on care. Um, if we, um, you know, we want to continue to expand our network of hospitals across the state and make sure that um, we make it easier for people in these small communities to really access care. And I already mentioned telehealth. I mean, we've been doing telehealth for over 30 years. It's a critical tool. Um, fortunately, in many ways, the pandemic did shine a light on uh, telehealth. However, uh, the uncertainty about how this can be, or not how it can be used, but um, when it should be used and how it will get reimbursed uh, is, still, um, is still unknown. And we think we have the right infrastructure. We think we understand um, how to take care of patients. And we think that the regulatory uh, framework really needs to support that. Um, and it, as the technology continues to expand, um, we need to um, face these issues head on. And it, it shouldn't be a political battle. It should be what's right for the patient. And, you know, even creating a digital front door, for example, I mean, the consumers have changed so dramatically during this time. So we need um, those resources to better, uh, or to allow our patients to better navigate, to have the tools at their fingertips and the solutions that they need to really manage their care. I mean, even uh, during the pandemic and people didn't have the ability with broadband to be uh, virtual um, on video, many had a smartphone in their hand and they were able to uh, communicate and have many of their health healthcare needs addressed during that time. Um, so as we shift from the traditional healthcare into um, the different models of care, uh, the payment mechanism has to catch up with the way we deliver care. And I realize that um, just another example that I would share is we've had a well-established hospital at home program, very successful. We've delivered on our promise of uh, lowering the cost of care we have high quality, high safety, and the patient experience is better than those who have an inpatient hospital stay. Getting your care in your bedroom or in your living room is much 
better for people than having to be in a hospital unless the hospital stay is necessary. So when you think about that, it's kind of um, uh, intuitively obvious that as we think about the best way to take care of patients, reimbursement should follow. But it's been a huge challenge. And um, our health plan pays for the service. Now some other national payers are considering it, as is the uh, federal government uh, beyond the, uh, the pandemic crisis. So it's, um, it's really having the government keep up with this rapid pace of change and making sure that we put the patient first. That's such great insight. And I, I, I wonder if um, maybe we could close, Susan, with some, we, we talked a lot about the challenges, many of which, like you said, are systemic that that we face um, in the rural part of the country relative to access to health. And but I wonder, you know, based on your your career as a um, as not only a physician but now as an executive <laughs> in that space in the country, what advice would you give to your colleagues across the country um, re relative to, to successfully um, going into rural health and providing better access that is affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, um, you know, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, um, we know that rural health care has systemic issues and it will require systemic uh, solutions. And we know that we can't address all the obstacles that exist right now. So, I think the important thing is to remember that we do need to work with partners. We have to work with people within our communities uh, to help uh, serve our patients. We have to work with our state and our um, uh, uh, national elected leaders and really other like-minded industry groups to really collaborate on the biggest challenges, um, on the biggest challenges that we have. I, I do believe that when um, we do view the world differently than others, and we do know how to make it uh, work, but we can't live solely in our legacy. We must do that um, fundamental transformation to make um, uh, to meet our patient care needs, and it requires an investment. And but when you see the need and you see the opportunity, and you're attracted by the mission, I think it it's much easier to um, get that collaboration across entities to really. Um, uh, you know, really do that service. Yeah, we, we sort of started to see your point about partnerships as a common theme across the country when we talk to your colleagues who are, you know, deploying similar moonshots. It's, you know, they say we, we can't go it alone, right? We have to partner with our colleagues, whether they're local or global or, or whatever. And um, we, listen, those, Dr. Turner, we just want to thank you. We, we appreciate you taking the time. We're inspired by your moonshot. Um, we're behind you 100%. And th thank you for joining us today. Well, I, I appreciate it very much. It was fun. I hope it turned out okay. Thanks, Susan. Great. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks for the time. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, David. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Alvarez and Marcel Leadership, Action, Results. So, John, I think that our listeners today are really going to enjoy hearing from Dr. Turney. You know, she has a really tough job trying to lead an organization that has both a health plan, a provider system across so many communities that are truly rural. It, it was sort of uh, amazing to me to hear her quote. I mean, so much of the great data that she alluded to, but in particular... I think it was 45,000 square miles of coverage. I think that was the number, right? 45,000 square miles. Yeah. Yeah. That is, I mean, to sort of be, being uh, the predominantly the sole provider in a community that's so expansive, um, when you are faced with challenges like lack of resources, lack of bandwidth and, and broadband, it just seems so daunting. Um, and but, but they're tackling it head on and um, it really is inspirational. Yeah, I think that's the right word, inspiration. When you listen to her, you see that passion of a physician leader that knows that they are given a really tough situation, but that they're not giving up. And 
her determination to overcome many of the structural issues and societal issues, I think, really uh, gives you the hope that she's going to be able to do that and that she is making a big difference in her communities. So what's so interesting to me about the strategy that they've deployed as they've built their infrastructure to, uh, to more adapt to rural health, they've actually had to add hospitals and add acute beds, which is sort of, I don't know, the inverted version of the strategy that you see other health systems deploying. And in large part, it seems like because that's a direct reflection of, reflection of what the community needs, right? The community needs in those sort of more rural areas, potentially acute beds. Well, I think that's right, John, and I think that's the real policy issue that so many people have been dealing with is, is the critical access hospital the right model for rural health care? Clearly, there needs to be some type of presence in the community, and uh, particularly where it would take so long to be able to reach the help that people need. But the structure of the critical access hospital has been one that's been generally inefficient and expensive to maintain. So I think that the rural healthcare systems of the future are trying to think about how do you how do you find that right balance between virtual and physical care? As you think about, and Susan alluded to it, both sort of the the catastrophe that is the lack of access in the rural setting and the not the ever present and continuing to get worse. Um, issue and challenge of of shortages in staff relative to clinicians and providers and um it's to your question earlier david you wonder how uh the government can help with that infrastructure both in terms of um whether it's you know broadband in the rural setting to your point better support for critical access um and also what are we going to do to create a workforce that is for um, especially for RNs and for physician providers, um, strong enough and big enough to take on the needs in the rural health setting and, for that matter, more broadly across the entire country, all, all clinical settings. Yeah, John, I think if there's ever an issue that really requires public private partnerships, it's going to be addressing the rural health care needs of our community. And we didn't even talk a lot about the behavioral health care needs in rural America, but yeah. that's significant as well. But the good news is, is that this is an issue that I think that there's bipartisan support on. There's enough people who are in public office that understand this issue that come and serve rural communities. And when you have leaders like Dr. Susan Turney that are outspoken and strong advocates and articulate about the issue. There are the right partners between the private sector and those in government to find solutions. 